All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for a trip to Prague. Professional tour guide Max Hooter uh, has prepared a basic introduction to the highlights and unique riches the city of Prague has to offer through maps, 3D models, old paintings, and contemporary aerial and 360 photographs. Max aims to explain one of the best historically preserved and beautiful cities of Europe to an American audience in understandable terms. During the past 10 years, he has done countless tours of uh, uh, Czechia, oh boy, Max, I messed that one up, huh? Uh, which is the capital uh, for tourists and locals. Uh, since the pandemic, he has started to do virtual tours and online presentations about his hometown. Uh, and again, want to thank the uh, Corning Foundation and the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. Excuse my inability to, pr to pronounce words. Uh, so all uh, 160 of us or so who are watching live and those that will watch the recording, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Max for joining us this morning. And Max, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. And never mind the pronunciations of Czechia, as I myself have mispronounced many English words, uh, and I probably am still pronouncing a lot that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I've been, uh, during the pandemic years, a virtual tour guide, and I especially uh, taken, uh, I've taken some liking in the web webinar form because it gives me uh, to, uh, towards, in comparison towards regular uh, tour guiding work, it gives me uh, an opportunity to present, uh, to put buildings together in a um, next to each other that normally would not be next to each other and also illustrate some finer topics. And really, if I would like uh, to present Prague to you, uh, today, I will start sort of in broad uh, outlines, in broad strokes, uh, more first ta talking about the history of the city and uh, of my nation, of the, of the Czech nation. Uh, and only after we've sort of uh, started to uh, re like get, a, get a finer sense for like what Prague actually is in the, in the greater scheme of things. <laughs> Sorry. Only then after I will proceed to some monuments. So uh, there's going to be uh, first some um, a more of a history lesson, but then uh, that will allow us to plow through the monuments faster and with greater sense. So uh, before we before we begin, um, the first topic that I think is uh, necessary to explain when we're talking about Prague is what is Central Europe? Because I have heard from many visitors or uh, other people, especially if they're uh, not, or even Europeans, uh, talk about Prague as being a city in, in Eastern Europe, uh, which is, of course, something uh, like nowadays when you look at a map of Europe, this is a lot of times when you look at a map of regions in Europe, this is what you will get, that you will get Southern Europe in the Mediterranean, uh, then you will get the British Isles, which are a world of its own, Northern Europe with all the Viking heritage, and then, of course, Eastern Europe, uh, all those countries that used to be behind the Iron Curtain uh, during the Cold War. That is a recent uh, division. However, as I would like to explain, it is not one of importance, especially when we're talking about historical monuments. Uh, and I would really love to introduce to you a topic of Central Europe uh, being completely uh, different, uh, really being completely unrelated to the Iron Curtain that was spanned across Europe uh, by the Soviet Union for, uh, for 41 years. Now, uh, even if we're talking nature, uh, Central Europe does exist in the way that you have Atlantic in the West, you have um, Central Russian, Boreal, Pontic in the East, you have Mediterranean, Sub-Mediterranean in the South, and then uh, even the nature in this area in Hungary, Germany, Poland, Czechia, Slovakia, Switzerland, even Western France uh, has, uh, well, similar flowers, similar trees, uh, similar uh, animals. Uh, but uh, the perhaps more important than the nature stuff is, of course, uh, the history. And it all, of course, has to do with the Roman Empire. 
Well, the Roman Empire was sort of the first major European civilization that was uh, that was global, uh, and it existed uh, sort of in uh, the south of the continent around the Mediterranean Sea uh, that the Romans even called our sea because they controlled basically every single uh, every single uh, shore in in that area. Uh, however, uh, more to the north in uh, well, today Czechia would be somewhere, somewhere around here. Just for your reference, this is Germany. Uh, here in the north, we have Scandinavia, Poland, uh, Ukraine. Uh, here, uh, of, of course, and those were there were parts of uh, Europe, today's Europe, that were in the Roman Empire. There were parts also that were not. And also, what um, further is important um, towards. Uh, Towards the end of the Roman Empire, uh, th this whole realm, this whole gigantic state was already so huge that it was split up into two, the Western uh, Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire in 395 certain uh, common age, uh, where um, more and more Eastern Roman Empire started to gravitate towards uh, Greek culture and uh, the Western Roman Empire started to gravitate towards uh, uh, towards Italian, or should I say Roman culture. Uh, and this would eventually also, um, 600 years later, we, uh, be reflected in uh, the approach to Christianity. Uh, because uh, around the year 1000, there would be the split between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, between the Greek and the La Latin Church. And whilst... Um, and, uh, and here's an important uh, distinction, really, uh, apart from all the theology uh, between, um, between Orthodox and Catholic. Orthodox churches are not centralized. Every nation's um, patriarch is independent of the other uh, patriarchs, which may create some strong balance between the local ruler and the local patriarch. But uh, there is no, no such thing as we know from from really from from Latin Europe, where you have maybe various rulers in various parts of uh, the Christian realms, but then all of the church is organized around one single pope in Rome, and that would allow a lot of cultural exchange between all the Catholic areas, all the areas that were uh, that were part of this Latin Church. There would be for a thousand years intense cultural exchange. And here, uh, as you can see, Czech, uh, Czechia being a part of the Holy Roman Empire, I'll get to that later, is deeply seated in Catholic territory. This, by the way, uh, this has not changed much, uh, even with uh, the birth of Protestantism. Here you can see in blue, uh, eventually uh, regions that split away from the Pope, nevertheless, still uh, carrying that internationalism um, of the original Latin church with them. Um, and if you see, uh, if you look at today at the map of uh, Orthodox Protestants and Catholics, the borders are very much the same as they were a thousand years ago. It, there's uh, not that much of a difference between this and between this. Um, so Czechs are uh, definitely a part of the Western world uh, in a way that they are not orthodox, uh, and they haven't been uh, for a thousand years. Uh, however, uh, then there is also another important distinction. Uh, then you could say perhaps that why are why do we really talk about Central Europe if there's uh, just Western and Eastern, depending on what empire do you draw uh, or what empire do you root in? Um, but then there's also a bit of a problem. And that is the spread of Christianity. Uh, towards the end of uh, the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity became uh, a unifying religion in um, an empire that was once uh, pagan, that was once uh, worshipping various different Greek and Roman gods. And then Christianity started to uh, be, well, even after this vehicle of the Roman Empire fell apart, Christianity sort of was the only uh, legacy that stood uh, strong even after the Roman Empire fell apart. And, and then it started to spread across Europe. Here you can see the Christianization of Europe that happened uh, throughout late antiquity and the Middle Ages. And uh, here there's already uh, this, you can, it, it's fascinating how uh, the map 
uh, of uh, the Roman Empire is almost matching the map of Christianity and how all these regions in Central, Northern, and Eastern Europe only get Christianized later. Therefore, they also uh, get later in touch with antiquity and with all the cultural heritage that uh, constitutes Europe, which would create a sort of a handicap. As you can see, Germany was kind of almost, uh, well, parts of Germany were part of the Roman Empire, parts of them were very close, but the Czechs Christianized uh, not earlier than around the year 900, 1000. And until today, I think uh, there's a certain, uh, it's, it's fascinating how in Europe you can, you can feel uh, the cultural, um, the cultural setback that uh, Central uh, European nations have uh, suffered from joining Christianity later. Um, this is especially seen here uh, in the first post-Roman Empire, the, uh, the uh, Empire of Charlemagne, uh, the uh, pretty much the first Holy Roman Emperor who uh, controlled France, Italy, Germany, but not the Czechs. Uh, the Czechs really here um, at the edge, at the borderlines, and that's sort of what constitutes Central Europe being a periphery of the West. Um, whereas throughout the Middle Ages, of course, uh, in Central Europe, uh, Christ uh, Christianity and Western culture would even set foot in the kingdoms of Bohemia, that is the Czech kingdom. Uh, you, we will uh, uh, talk about that name later on. In Poland, in Hungary, partially also in Lithuania, in uh, today's Belarus and Ukraine, but not in Muscovy and not in the Ottoman uh, Ottoman Empire, in, in in Turkey, pretty much in the uh, the southeast. Now, another typical uh, another typical thing for Central Europe is the dominance of um, of Germans, really, because Germans uh, are the ones uh, who in uh, Central Europe's past were the ones who inherited uh, the, sorry, uh, who inherited the, the Roman legacy directly, and then they were passing on the material culture, uh, the know-how, uh, the cultural know-how to other nations. Also, because they were much more efficient and, uh, and bringing civilization, they were uh, they were uh, colonizing more and more towards the East. And here you can see, uh, like in the year 700, that dark red territory. Uh, this is not even all of today's Germany. And then throughout the 8th, uh, the 10th, the 11th, uh, sort of they get to Berlin. Uh, and then uh, in the 13th century, already in high Middle Ages, even further uh, towards uh, today's Poland. Um, and of course, also into the Czech borderlands. And uh, really, this process of German Eastern colonization goes all the way until the 20th century and would reach pretty much all the way to Russia. Uh, here you can see uh, sort of uh, the enclaves that Germans have created in uh, not only in our territory, which was very, always very close and very intertwined with Germany, but also in Poland, in the Baltics, in uh, today's Slovakia and Hungary, in Romania, in today's Ukraine, even in Russia, go, reaching as far as, far, uh, as Georgia and Azerbaijan. Uh, most of these, uh, or like um, the, all this gigantic diaspora uh, all the way to the east was also eventually one of the reasons why the Nazis had thought of all these eastern territories as um, um, sort of a, uh, as German land, at least potentially. And that's also the reason why uh, from uh, almost all these territories, almost all the Germans were um, perched after 1945 to do not have that imperial ambition anymore. And that's kind of also the reason why Central Europe um, is uh, a, 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 a an unknown term uh, today. So in the uh, Central Europe, in the realms of, uh, of uh, the big German culture, not in the realm of Turkish culture, here you can see uh, Ottoman Turkish conquests in the Balkans uh, throughout uh, the 14th, 15th, and 16th century, reaching as far away as Budapest, uh, but never really to Vienna, never to Prague right here. And the, the same could be said about uh, the Russian e expansion uh, going towards the West, uh, where 
uh, Russians reached all the way to Warsaw for a short time. Warsaw and uh, and Budapest, Poland and Hungary, also part of Central Europe, but they also had uh, their experiences with uh, sort of falling into uh, alien realms of Orthodox and Muslims. I am talking about this a lot, uh, about these religions, because the religious sphere of influence is uh, really key, not necessarily the ethnicity or, or language uh, back in the day. Um, yeah, in the, um, in the last pre-modern centuries, this would be uh, sort of uh, in the 19th century, you would see that uh, there would be big empires created, uh, a lot of nations lost agency. Uh, there would be the Austrian Empire, there would be uh, the Prussian uh, Kingdom, later empire, uh, that would uh, sort of extend the German presence uh, all across uh, this gigantic Central European area. And that's sort of where eventually what constitutes Central Europe when thought of today. So in summary, it's it's not about, uh, if you see a map of, of regions of Europe like this, uh, it does not really reflect um, historical, um, the historical situation or contemporary mindset, the heritage, uh, and uh, this, one be, this one would be much more accurate. So I will be talking about uh, Czechia as a central European country and Prague as a central European city. So the key takeaways here are, um, a borderline between Western and Eastern Europe is a concept based in the Cold War. And uh, really, it is a recent, but a short and atypical episode, especially when it comes uh, to Czechia and Prague. Um, as I said, it's not about language and uh, culture in Europe is not necessarily based on language and ethnicity, but more on the religion and the power centers that would allow uh, the share, uh, the sharing of culture. Uh, and Central Europe is a region with only indirect inheritance of antiquity, making it often a delayed periphery of Western Europe. Uh, yet it is, um, uh, yeah, and, and the dominant force uh, were the Germans uh, in this region spreading development as well as oppression. Think of this, um, perhaps this is uh, for uh, Americans a good, uh, a good allegory. Think of Ireland. And a nation uh, and a country that was heavily under the influence of the English and uh, also uh, was uh, had sort of a mixed bag uh, of, um, of experiences with the English. Um, and there would be, uh, so in, in maybe the Czechs are the, the Irish of Central Europe and uh, the um, Germans are our English. Or you can find similar situations with Sweden and Finland uh, with Italy and Croatia, there's a lot of there's a lot of big cultures and small cultures. The big influence in the small um, in in Europe. That's a typical situation. Uh, Central Europe also that's a big uh, important thing. Never had colonies like Western Europe, uh, but unlike Eastern Europe, it was never or only for a short while colonized by Moscow or Istanbul uh, by Russia or the Turks. Um, However, there were repeated periods when uh, really um, in the West, there would be uh, wars, uh, perhaps wars only for profit. Uh, and uh, in the East, there were wars uh, when um, Central Europeans had to defend themselves and, um, and the West against a Turkish or Russian um, expansionist, uh, expansionist ideas and the war of Ukraine really uh, is yet another example of that. Okay, now I also um, would like to put in perspective how old Prague really is, um, because uh, from the American perspective, it will uh, maybe uh, look like it's just it's just old, but there are degrees uh, to old, and uh, various European regions are um, not all of the same old. So just uh, for comparison, uh, I have created this timeline where uh, you can see uh, sort of in red here and uh, antiquity with uh, with uh, with Greek, uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome sort of stretching from uh, 1200 before common age all the way uh, to the year 500. And then you have uh, the Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages of all the barbarian kingdoms. Um, the High Middle Ages with the birth of Romanesque and eventually uh, Gothic architecture, 
the late Middle Ages when uh, sort of you, you have already the uh, system um, of uh, feudalism and many other things falling apart, and then pretty much like still um, sort of this uh, the autumn of the Middle Ages is uh, this is a coin uh, this is a term coined by French medieval uh, historian Jacques Le Goff, uh, the autumn of Middle Ages after book print after creating uh, the new uh, after conquering the new world after Protestantism, but sort of the feudal structure and Europe as a whole, Christian or um, as a Christian civilization, it still keeps on uh, until we get um, really since the 1700s into uh, early modern times, and then um, the industrial re uh, revolution and the modern civilization. Uh, here I have compared a, a timeline of American events. Uh, it's just a few uh, simple ones. Um, uh, one the year 1000, still the Middle Ages the middle of the middle ages really when vikings sailed to the shores of america 1492 columbus uh discovering uh the caribbean is sort of one of the one of the dates that is usually given as uh the end of the middle ages uh you have then uh the mayflower um in the, the american independence and the civil war and here in the center this red represents the timeline of Prague, when uh this is sort of a few uh, some 80 years before, um, or like 100 years before Vikings sailed to the shore shores of America, Prague uh, was born, we don't know the exact date, but started to develop itself, same for the Czech nation, at the periphery of the post-Roman world, uh, then uh, in the 1350s, like between the 1350s and the late 1700s, uh, would be uh, the time when most of the classical Prague monuments were built. So you could really uh, say that uh, it's like a it's a century and a half before Columbus pra Prague, the historical beautiful Prague that I have uh, talked that, that I will talk about started to be built. Uh, then it was uh, pretty much built all the way until um, the independence years. And uh, then there would be also uh, an episode of building Prague in the 19th and 20th century, but we will not go uh, this far. Uh, when I uh, break it down, uh, in, when I sort of zoom in, you can see that uh, really the, that Prague is in a way, uh, and that's maybe um, a good summary of what I'm trying to say here. Prague, historical Prague, uh, is a city built at the end of the Middle Ages and during the transitional period of um, uh, a transitional period between the Middle Ages and modern times. When, so all these things that sort of, uh, that turn, um, uh, all these events and all these trends that uh, transformed Middle Age, uh, the Europe of the Middle Ages into the modern era, I'm talking about the humanist movement and critical um, and critical reading of the Bible. I'm talking about printing books, the uh, process of reformation, uh, colonialism, uh, religious wars, the age of enlightenment, finally. Uh, all these uh, terms shaped uh, Prague's history and all these things first and foremost are visible uh, in Prague. That's sort of, uh, that's what you can observe in this city is the transformation from the Middle Ages into modern times. That's what this is going to be about. Uh, now, also, uh, I would like to present in a nutshell the Czech history, now that we know sort of what time period we are in and what region we are in. Um, basically, uh, the Czechs, uh, if you compare um, the Czech history to, let's say, the French history, the history is uh, in a way shorter because we started around the year 900 when, uh, let's say, France was already on um, a part of Western civilization for 900 years, really, with all that comes with it, um, with the exposure to antique culture and eventually to Christianity. Um, we sort of had a late start around the year 900, well, in the year 1000, begin, uh, begin the High Middle Ages, and we had to catch up on a lot of things once we were accepted into the greater European family. Um, there would be at first uh, this 
uh, realm of uh, Great Moravia, this um, large Slavic, but nevertheless short-lived uh, country at the edge of the Western civilization, where there would be already the first churches. Uh, it's interesting, it was a Greek mission. It was, uh, we could have ended up Orthodox, but very soon uh, the Greek Christianity was uh, pushed out from Latin, by Latin priest uh, from the West and the center of uh, the Czech statehood started to shift from this area, from Moravia to the West, uh, where uh, after the year 1000, sort of, this is the outline pretty much of Czechia today. Um, yes, throughout our history, there have been uh, some uh, changes in uh, the outline of the, of the country, but this really for a thousand years was our territory and still is. And on that territory, there would be a lot of catching up uh, once, um, once we joined the Western world building castles and establishing feudalism with aristocratic families, um, building monasteries uh, and writing um, all, um, uh, all these copies of, uh, of uh, Western knowledge that was already written down in Western monasteries. I'm talking about building, uh, building cities very often with German artisans because they only knew the crafts uh, that would otherwise not be uh, known to the locals. Um, exp like upgrading the technology of agriculture uh, and weapons, uh, introducing coinage, all these things, uh, well, like in, uh, all these things were uh, existing in Western Europe already um, in the previous centuries, but we sort of had to catch up on a lot of, on a lot of these things that's uh, and eventually uh, there would be uh, even a court culture with um, with uh, Minasang and with all these uh, courts this is a picture from the 13th century when the Czech uh, kings were already heavily Germanized in both language and culture and there would be a lot of German influence around uh, now uh, all of this catching up eventually uh, in uh, Czech history was crowned by the glory of the Luxembourg Empire because um, in after some three or four hundred years of uh, of catching up, uh, the local dynasty on the throne that built the country up and uh, sort of made it a part of the Western world um, no longer has male heirs, and a new dynasty shows up in uh, the House of Luxembourg. Uh, in particular, Charles the Fourth is the absolute centerpiece of uh, Czech and Prague history, a man uh, who for the very first time, uh, not only uh, really uh, had the Czech lands here in the Eastern part of the Roman empire, but sort of uh, became a power all across uh, this umbrella German state, the Holy Roman empire. Um, where in Violet, you can see all his dominions and uh, he even managed to uh, become elected Holy Roman emperor. So during his time, for the very first time, Prague became practically the capital of not only of the Czechs, but pretty much of all of Germany, uh, building the city into uh, one of the biggest cities in Europe of that time, uh, starting a university, uh, building a big, beautiful cathedral on Prague Castle, uh, supporting arts. Uh, Prague all of a sudden became a uh, center of European importance. Uh, in paintings um, and sculptures, and uh, very soon all this beauty, uh, including uh, the uh, top model uh, Madonnas, uh, started to uh, really, well, uh, introduce some changes. And that is, these changes would uh, be the Hussite Revolution and Kingdom. Um, now, um, because there was so, such ex acceleration in uh, Czech history all of a sudden under Charles IV, in particular the acceler acceler acceleration through the university, uh, there would be some, well, critical ideas about religion. Uh, in particular, uh, here you can see a caricature of the devil selling indulgences. Uh, basically, the church was forgiving sins for money, and the Czechs, uh, because of all the education that was all of a sudden around, um, happened to notice. And very soon, uh, there would be a critical movement starting in Prague, uh, saying uh, that um, here you can see a caricature of a uh, of a cardinal uh, 
making a whore the pope. Um, that kind of was uh, the idea of the day that the, that the church is not about uh, de the dedication and true faith in Christ, but it is a power structure. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty self-evident what they were trying to say. Uh, all this was uh, mainly occurring in the preachings of a certain university professor named Jan Hus, who uh, was held, uh, holding, uh, holding sermons in Prague that were drifting away from the official teachings of the church, uh, which also in the end uh, became the, um, the reason of his downfall and uh, burning at the stake at a church council. Uh, however, uh, before the church got rid of him, he managed to spread his ideas uh, into pretty much uh, the first bona fide Protestant church. And uh, by the way, this is some 120 years before Martin Luther, when uh, the Czech uh, Hussites, the followers of Jan Hus, were already giving full communion uh, to everybody uh, who were um, putting a strong emphasis in, on Bible, no, excuse me, full emphasis on Bible studies, uh, on um, equality uh, before God, poverty of the church, etc. So that would be, we were, we arrived at Protestantism 120 years too early. Um, very soon, uh, this uh, new religion starting in Prague and uh, capturing the hearts of pretty much um, the majority of the Czechs would have to defend themselves against crusades that would be sent after our nation. Uh, so really from, uh, from the top leading country in Europe, all of a sudden we were the heretics, we were the black sheep. Uh, and in the end, uh, both the Hussite majority and the Catholic minority uh, defended their positions in that war, but the aftermath was was heartbreaking. Uh, until today, everywhere where you go, and you will discover historical monuments in our country, uh, with every monastery, with every castle, with every city, you will, uh, around the, in the 1400s, there's going to be a note that the monastery, city, or castle was raised and burned down by those sites. This is an example of a church uh, from 14th century, from the glorious era of Charles Charles IV, and this is what it's left after the Hussite Wars. It was kind of the first uh, premature premature end to the Middle Ages uh, of ours. And then there would be, of course, rebuilding. Um, the dynasty, the royal dynasty, was gone, so the aristocrats had to elect uh, a new king out of their own ranks, who sort of uh, managed to build up the country, even introducing a new dynasty. And royal power was restored. Here you can see Prague Castle in the 1400s after the Hussite Wars under a new dynasty becoming a big center of government again. Uh, however, the king's power was now severely limited by a parliament of city and aristocratic representatives. Um, this new dynasty, however, was very short lived. Uh, again, uh, only two kings and then. Uh, the Czech aristocrats were looking for someone new to take over, and that would be the House of Habsburgs. Uh, now, the Habsburgs, originally an Austrian family, uh, were um, made some, well, were a very clever people because they uh, managed to occupy the thrones, not only of Austria, but also uh, later Spain. And in the 1520s, they also uh, managed to become kings of, Hung uh, of Hungary and kings of Bohemia, right around the time when Martin Luther uh, in Germany hammers his thesis on the church uh, door and starts Protestantism. So in about the same time as when actual Protestantism in Europe starts, we all of a sudden have Catholic monarchs. And the Catholic monarchs are promising that they will keep the religious freedoms in the country. But... Um, well, they didn't really. And more and more with time, you would have Jesuits. Uh, here you can see the first group of Jesuits, this uh, order made for counter-reformation, um, come to the city of Prague, where meanwhile, uh, local Hussites were more and more uh, getting integrated into um, Lutheran and Calvinist churches. Um, and uh, this uh, standoff between a Protestant people and a Catholic uh, ruler would eventually uh, result in a conflict uh, with uh, Protestants making a coup in Prague, throwing the Catholic 
uh, governors out of the country. And uh, then eventually the Catholic army, once it reached Prague, executing those rebels and introducing a new constitution where Catholicism was the only allowed religion and German uh, would become uh, pretty much the only office language, the only language of higher state administration, culture, and Czech would become sort of a language of the peasants and servants. Um, unlike the Irish, uh, the Czechs have never lost their language completely, um, but uh, nevertheless, it was uh, heavily pushed back. Um, the conflict, however, between Catholics and Protestants uh, was going on for the next 30 years in the in this so-called 30 years war, we're talking Mayflower times, a uh, times of big religious turbulence in Europe, um, and would uh, destroy a lot of population in, in Europe, including Czech population. Uh, the armies very often were going through lowlands where there were Czech people living, whereas those mountains that were uh, settled with German towns and villages uh, remained spare. So that contributed further to the Germanization of the country. Um, and of course, burning Protestant books and cracking down on secret Protestants would become um, a, uh, another form of oppression. Recatholization of uh, Protestant churches. Here you can see that's a medieval church, but it has all of a sudden Baroque altars uh, because that's the times of recatholization. Uh, new monasteries being built. Uh, foreign uh, aristocrats who were loyal to the Austrian regime uh, were given land and built wonderful chateaus uh, around the country. But eventually the Austrian st state also introduced education and uh, that contributed large to a um, very early education, of course, um, contributed to the nation's survival and also to very quick and early industrialization. Now I will, um, because I uh, have sort of, I wanted to um, also um, do a follow-up on modern history in the terms of monuments, but I will uh, go through this very quickly as I was thinking, well, we're already, um, we're already uh, some 40 minutes into uh, the tour and I haven't even shown a monument. So real quick, uh, the Czechs eventually would struggle for independence, uh, creating this whole movement against Austrians. Uh, eventually, uh, the Austrian Empire, uh, in an age of nationalism, was an absolute mess of nations, um, to which the Czechs responded after World War I by creating Czechoslovakia, a common state with uh, our broader nation, the Slovaks, who were uh, suffering under Hungary, um, but really creating another national mess. Uh, as you can see, large German territories, large Hungarian territories, even in the East, uh, Ukrainians. Uh, and uh, that would be a very unstable, uh, that would be a very unstable um, country uh, facing World War II. Uh, and um, eventually this conflict between Czechs and Germans will, would lead uh, to the expulsion of all the Germans from our territory. You can see them packing suitcases and being marked by swastikas in 1946. Um, and then you have the Iron Curtain uh, drawing uh, back. Uh, but uh, things got better. And um, nowadays, um, sort of Central Europe is reconstituting itself, no longer under the dominant heel of the Germans who have lost um, really uh, merit, um, but uh, as a part of the West. Uh, so key takeaways, the, the history of the Czech people starts in the ninth century AD, quite late. For most of its history, the Czech state was more or less integrated into the German realm. Um, Czechs made a very early step towards Protestantism, but were eventually forced by the Austrians, by the Habsburgs, to Catholic religion. And uh, due to the op oppression, Czechs sought breaking away from their German connection in modern times. And they succeeded, but for a terrible price of ethnic purges, discontinuity, and mu a much crueler short subjugation from Russians. This is, of course, history very simplified. Uh, if you know something about Czech history and would like to um, oppose this, you probably will be able to oppose this very uh, easily, but um, that's sort of the problem with every historical summary. Now, now um, 
the landscape in which Prague is. That's sort of the last of the introductory part. Um, is well, Czechia is sort of built uh, in a cauldron made out of mountains, uh, which really was a key factor in why we were not Germanized, because there was uh, always uh, a strong border be between us and all the German territories, and there would be a center here in the center, uh, in, in the middle of the country in Prague. Uh, the river Moldau that uh, Prague is on goes through very deep canyons through most of its course uh, on the upper river, as well as on the lower river, and Prague is located in uh, the area where the big main river of the land is on, uh, it's the, pretty much the only place where it gets wider, where all of a sudden you have a big valley. Uh, that's sort of why the capital is where it is, because there were forts and there was all of a sudden the thin, narrow valley was spreading out. So um, after the year 900, um, we begin of Prague monuments that I also broke up into various uh, into various time periods and also into various genres. That's sort of, that is sometimes people are overwhelmed with Prague um, presenting so much, but uh, I will try to break it up into periods and into, and into genres, mostly linked to the, mostly linked to the classes of people that were building these monuments. Uh, now in the high medieval times, if you remember, that was the time of catching up. Uh, Prague would uh, constitute itself between two castles, Prague Castle in the north and the Vyshehrad Castle in the south. Already in the 12th century, there would be numerous, numerous churches, which really is something that stayed with Prague for the next thousand years. And until today, just in the historical city center alone, you have 100 churches and standalone chapels. It's uh, quite a city of many, many uh, religious buildings. Um, if we, if we, um, if I go into, if I show you Prague and as a panorama, oh yeah, this is what I wanted to show. Uh, yes, this is Prague today, and until today, you can see quite easily that there is one castle in the south and one castle in the north on opposite sides of the river, and the city is between them. The outline, really, where you have this valley underneath the castle um as the city and uh here on the other river banks sort of the stripe of building connecting to uh the other castle that's pretty much the same as in the 12th century uh it is quite amazing how the outline of the city has not changed much in um a thousand years now uh when we're talking monuments from that era it's obviously the castle and some fortifications uh, the castle uh, in the 12th century would would already consist of several churches and the royal palace. Um, there's in the royal palace even 12th century halls on the ground floor still preserved from that era. Um, there's uh, a there, there's the so-called black tower still preserved and um, already in the 13th century, uh, not only the castle but also two uh, city areas would be uh, would be defended by walls. Here, the little site underneath the castle on, on, and on the other side, Old Town, connected both by the first bridge. Uh, there would be even, uh, there's uh, some of these city defenses are preserved until today. Um, this, by the way, this tower that the church has originally uh, also is a defensive structure. If I were to show you on a map, um, that would be sort of here you can see, uh, here you can see Old Town. And uh, that's where the city walls would be. And if I zoom in here, you can clearly find one tower right here. 
another one in inside this block and the third one being here part of the church this is sort of this is magical about Prague that you have fragments of all the various eras sometimes very well hidden uh, but once you discover them in some backyard or once you become once you put two and two together once you connect the lines uh, you all of a sudden are uh, able to see history um, like uh, you were not before. That's that's what is uh, special about this city. Uh, there will be, of course, a bridge connecting both uh, sides of the river. There's still uh, one arch of it preserved on one side of the river and a tower here on the left side on the other side of the river. But um, it was eventually re re replaced by a newer bridge. Um, Churches and monasteries also from that era. Uh, we have um, in and out of Prague, something like 25 of these original small round churches from uh, in, Romanesque, in Romanesque style from the 11th, uh, the 12th century. Uh, they have a pretty uh, unified design of uh, these, uh, they are these so-called rotundas. Um, sometimes there's also a basilica like on Prague Castle, a larger Romanesque structure and eventually Gothic would also make its way to Prague here. Uh, this is, for example, St. Agnes Convent, uh, one of the earliest examples of Gothic architecture in Prague, uh, still until today, a beautiful monastery. And of course, um, in the 1270s, um, the old new synagogue was built, uh, which until today stays pretty much in the same shape, uh, early Gothic architecture. It is the oldest synagogue in all of Europe. Uh, Prague also has some stone houses really of merchants and aristocrats preserved from that era, or should I say basements. Uh, this is uh, sort of the downtown area of the district called Old Town, where uh, all these black uh, squares are really um, basement rooms in uh, below various houses that go all the way, all the way back to the 1100s and the, to the 1200s. And there you can see the beauty of uh, Romanesque architecture there. Uh, basically, in the Old Town area, uh, the street level was raised, so many of these original basements are, uh, as a matter of, uh, sorry, uh, the original ground floors are nowadays underground floors, but we still have them preserved. This is what the houses uh, would probably look like in their original days. Um, that, too, can be found in Prague um, in, uh, in, well, several places, which is quite amazing that we actually have. Uh, city houses preserved from that era. Uh, now, under the Luxembourgs, however, Prague became what it is today because uh, Charles IV, uh, really that king introduced an absolute massive amount of uh, great projects that would uh, shape the city. And you can see that so the Luxembourg city, you can see in Prague until today. I'm talking about the university. Uh, first, uh, in the in first in Central Europe that still is in that building. I'm talking about Newtown and Castletown, these two, uh, these two new districts behind the castle and behind Old Town in particular, there would be Newtown all of a sudden uh, making Prague, well, all, well, there were only Roman Constantinople in Europe bigger, the two former capitals of Roman empires. And uh, besides that, no, nothing was uh, this big in size. Uh, I'm talking about the St. Vitus Cathedral, which replaced a uh, former smaller church. Uh, I'm talking, well, yeah, probably should show you that, uh, what, it, what it looks like today. Um, this is quite a late cathedral, it's something like 150 years into the, uh, into, uh, the creation of cathedrals, so it's particularly full of light. Uh, it is quite an advanced design with uh, the ribs already forming uh, not just crosses and fields, but uh, continuous network. Uh, it's already a first step towards late Gothic architecture, uh, quite, a rem quite a remarkable cathedral. I am talking about the new Charles Bridge that replaced the original uh, bridge being built for 50 years, really next to uh, the torso of, a, of the previous bridge that was 
uh, standing uh, there still. And we have that bridge in Prague until today, pretty much in the same shape. It's uh, one of the key monuments of Prague. Pretty much all the key monuments of Prague were created in that era. Uh, of course, the astronomical clock from, from 1410 that is still mounted on the city hall of the old town and still has about 75% of the original gears. It is the oldest uh, still running mechanical clock in the entire world. Um, and um, the castle, well, um, also receive, well, you can find their halls from that era. Uh, around Prague, you can see more of uh, fortifications still from the era of Charles IV. Uh, still some of the city walls are there where they were built 600 years ago. Uh, churches and monasteries, of course, pretty much every second church in Prague um, is uh, had a phase uh, in the 14th century. Maybe they are rebuilt uh, in later time, times, like the Saint Church of St. Egidius or the Church of St. Thomas. You can see this is not necessarily Gothic architecture, but uh, here you can see the outline, the walls, the skeleton um, is from that era, despite the church being reconstructed in later times. Same with uh, the Church of St. James, but there are also Gothic churches from the 14th century still preserved in, in their original appearance, like the Church of St. Apollinaire or uh, the Church of St. Henry, uh, the Church of Our Lady um, in Newtown. Um, it's quite a very rich uh, historical period. Monasteries, the Emmaus Monastery with beautiful frescoes depicting. Uh, scenes from the Bible. Uh, and of course, um, entire blocks um, of houses uh, that uh, until today are preserved, uh, like the, um, sometimes even the appearance is preserved, like the, the house of the stone bell. Um, arcades uh, in front of these houses, you can kind of see these arcades here on the right side. Um, the city hall of Old Town as a whole is from the 14th century, including uh, some interiors, some actually genuine uh, early 15th century interiors that were preserved there. Um, city houses, despite being reconstructed in later periods, uh, even like that's a Starbucks in Prague. Uh, here, look at that. There's the cross vault. Uh, that's a Starbucks in a 14th century room. Uh, and that's like the most common thing in Prague that no one is really, uh, jade, uh, that no one is startled by that. Um, the following Hussite revolution was more of an era of destruction at first, um, but nevertheless, uh, in the following era, uh, the castle got its final form with the beautiful Vladislav Hall. Um, uh, we're talking here late Gothic architecture. If Prague is really a place of some architectural style uh, that can be like, if, 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 if there's any architectural style that you should visit Prague for, like especially because of that architectural style, it's late Gothic architecture because what they were doing, for example, in the castle was quite amazing. Um, this is uh, the royal balcony in uh, the cathedral that they uh, added uh, with no support in the center. Late Gothic was kind of uh, already very developed in engineering and also quite quirky. Um, and uh, already the Renaissance style was introduced on the castle as well. Uh, new for uh, towers and gates of the city, um, churches. Well, of course, uh, these original preachings of Jan Hus were taking place uh, in that Bethlehem chapel, basically a gigantic barn where 3,000 people could fit in to uh, witness the sermon, but also um, the beautiful late Gothic parish church of Our Lady in Old Town was, was built in that era. Uh, these tower tops are um, really, they, they look like they were um, made as a movie set or something that this cannot be simply um, an authentic piece of Gothic architecture. It must be some fantasy, but it, it is actually not. Um, but also in that same era, um, another synagogue, um, the Pincus synagogue, which, which mixes Gothic and Renaissance forms. Um, and also from that era, we have in the Jew former Jewish ghetto, uh, the Jewish cemetery started in the early 1400s, uh, then going through the entire three following centuries as well. It's uh, one of the most important Jewish cemeteries in all 
of Europe. There will be also some city houses uh, built and every century of Prague, you can find pretty much all uh, traces of all the various classes of all the various genres um, that uh, you will think of uh, in a late medieval, early modern uh, situation. Um, but eventually Prague really came to a different new uh, fruition in the times of the Renaissance. When uh, the House of Habsburg, the new rulers, these Austrian rulers of our country uh, would move away from classical uh, housing of kings. They no longer wanted to hang out in a dark and gloomy castle and preferred much more to hang out in gardens and in villas, Italian style, uh, like exemplified by uh, the uh, Royal, Royal Summer Palace built by Italian architects. This is um, probably the purest Italian Renaissance architecture uh, in the icy north of Europe. Um, incredible building, uh, or um, in the same royal garden, there is a ball game hall. All of a sudden, the focus was on the human being, no longer on God. So uh, there would be sports um, outside of the city. There would be the new, uh, the new hunting grounds, uh, a new hunting forest where uh, there would be this um, extraordinary chateau built um, in the shape of a star with incredible stuccos. Uh, introducing alchemist principles really into architecture. Quite a remarkable structure, uh, nowhere to be found uh, in Europe. And on Prague Castle, there would be also new interiors like the Spanish Hall. Um, I'm obviously just uh, showing what is preserved. Uh, but even uh, despite this uh, not, not being maybe preserved in its entirety, uh, it is preserved in a beautiful way. Um, yeah, the castle would look just like an absolute fairy tale in those times. Uh, aristocrats would very often follow suit, and they would um, also um, more and more move into the city to become a part of the court uh, and uh, build, building themselves various residencies. This would be uh, particularly helped by the big fire of 1541, which uh, cleared uh, the entire districts of Castletown and here uh, Littletown. I still have written here Lesser Town, which is a mistake. Uh, when all of a sudden you would have uh, new uh, city residencies of various Czech aristocrats, uh, like, uh, for example, the Martinet Palace, uh, the Palace of the Lords of Hradec, my very favorite, the, the Schwarzenberg Palace, an absolute gem of Renaissance architecture, um, even preserving some Renaissance interiors. All of this, and, and there's many more. I just uh, have to like th this is the time. This is the time in uh, history where I uh, no longer can show you everything and have to more and more, or almost everything. And I, I, I will have to more and more just show you examples. Um, yes, city houses uh, and projects. The city would also uh, the burghers, the citizens of Prague, would more and more uh, adopt the Renaissance style. Um, and uh, all the various six cities uh, that were forming sort of the Prague agglomeration, um, having uh, graffitos like kind of an etching on the facade on their buildings or uh, having them just clean. Um, this is just uh, the glory of Renaissance Prague. Um, some houses have only like the portals preserved uh, or in this house there's also uh, beautiful arcades inside. Not everything is preserved completely. Uh, there's many fragments. There's many buildings that are rebuilt uh, several times. And so they show off various details from various eras. That's what Prague is for. Uh, sometimes beautiful painted wooden ceilings are uh, in, in many Prague uh, palaces and houses of that era. The city would also um, built uh, waterworks, we could say. This is a 16th century water tower that would lead, wa lead water into various fountains. Here, this fountain is from 1560. It's a beautiful uh, work of, uh, of some anonymous uh, Renaissance uh, blacksmith. And uh, certain districts would also, certain cities of Prague, Prague was not united until the 1780s, really. So in that era, there would be still various city halls. This, for example, is the city hall 
of the little town or a castle town would also have its small Renaissance city hall. Uh, now, after recapitalization and uh, the Thirty Years' War, uh, Baroque would be synonymous really with Catholic religion and with the heavy dominance of aristocrats and the church over citizens. And uh, the castle, of course, being vacant because more and more of the country was centralized in Vienna. So uh, this, uh, this beautiful silhouette of the Renaissance castle would eventually become much more plainer. Um, there would be a sort of a more uniform rebuilding. Uh, the castle lost has lost some of its beauty, has become more uniform, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is an absolutely stunning monument, uh, where even with Baroque interiors, where uh, the House of Habsburg would reside, should they ever visit Prague, which occurred rarely. Uh, these rooms are nowadays used as the uh, representative spaces of the Czech president. Uh, all around Prague, there would be new fortifications, uh, withstanding cannons, that's uh, the red lines uh, that you can see all around with new gates um, and uh, with uh, being capable with standing cannon fire. Um, some of them are still, some of those walls are still preserved. Uh, the, and the aristocrats would build many, many new palaces and reconstruct old ones uh, like the Sumptuous Wallenstein Palace uh, with an absolutely gorgeous garden. Um, uh, with an artificial cave wall. Um, I'm talking about uh, palaces that would have magnificent entrances, um, incredible uh, dancing halls, um, or uh, absolutely breathtaking gardens like the Burba Garden, which is sort of like several terraces on top of each other. Uh, and I don't even know like how to capture this in pictures because you just have to you just have to go there. It's like on every terrace, on every terrace, the garden gets different um, in a slope of the hill with absolutely breathtaking views of Prague. This is uh, Prague Baroque in terms of the aristocrats, but even probably more sumptuous, the churches and monasteries. And of course, also, uh, we won't let out synagogues. Um, talking in particular about the St. Nicholas Church in Littletown in absolutely gorgeous uh, display of Baroque church architecture right here. Um, from uh, it, It's asymmetrical from every uh, hill, from, ev from the bridge. It looks just so different um, because it has a bell tower, it has a cupola. They're always in a different constellation. Uh, really behind the cathedral, probably the second most beautiful church. And uh, just look at that interior. That is um just absolutely uh out of this um oh my now I, now i maybe have oh okay one more time sorry about that yeah the absolute pinnacle of croc baroque Her design, fine art, frescoes, statues, everything comes together to bring this idea of a Catholic God that is victorious over the evil Protestants in the capital of the kingdom of the Czechs. Mon uh, there will be also um, pilgrimage places all over the place, so like, for example, the Loreto. Uh, a uh, a copy, a, a franchise of the House of the Virgin Mary brought from Italy uh, that would have um, an absolutely stunning uh, church in its insides. This is just, you know, cherry picking out of all the various Baroque church interiors that can be found in Prague. We could just uh, do a an hour and a half uh, of a virtual presentation of just Prague Baroque architecture in churches because there's so much of it. Uh, um, and of course, there will be also monasteries um, like the Strauch Monastery with an incredible uh, library from the 1670s. Um, and uh, even a bigger and more beautiful library 
out of the 1770s. Also their church, uh, the Church of Our Lady, uh, quite astonishing. This is really, um, the 1700s are the thickest layer of monuments in Prague. This of course is originally a 12th century church, but uh, the interior got heavily revamped in, uh, in the 1700s. That is something very typical of Prague that you don't have, uh, that, that most, most commonly the monuments will have many, many different layers to them. Um, the Clementinum College, yet another uh, beautiful Jesuit structure, the Jesuit University. Uh, with its gigantic library, um, with um, its uh, with its um, summer refectory, which is nowadays the National Library. This is sort of when you study old books in Prague, or like not even uh, not as old. Uh, most commonly, you go and sit down under these little angels that are hanging upside down from the ceiling, looking at you. Um, Prague uh, has kept a lot of the, because there are so many historical monuments, a lot of them can be also used simply as uh, ministries, galleries, uh, public institutions. Uh, not everything has to be uh, like presented or used only for touring, only for historical monuments. That's the beauty of it. Um, and then, yeah, more Baroque churches uh, or bar Baroqueized. Uh, like uh, re, uh, rebuilt in Baroque style. It, is, it just goes on and on. Uh, the Charles Bridge would also receive statues. Uh, for the first 300 years of its existence, it was empty. And then during recapitalization times, many different benefactors and many different artists have uh, created this incredible gallery uh, that continues to be one of uh, Prague's most precious and admired things like the Gothic uh, bridge with the Baroque statues of saints on it. It's quite impressive. And uh, of course, not to forget uh, the beautiful Baroque, um, the beautiful Baroque Clausen synagogue. And uh, then of course we have citizens houses. Very commonly the houses were already standing, but uh, though they were from the middle ages, uh, from uh, originally Gothic or uh, Renaissance, but then they only got a new touch up. So here, for example, you can still see the Gothic medieval tower that just got a Baroque facade. Uh, or in this case, you can see the Gothic entrance and the Gothic shop window on the bottom. And the rest of the building was coated with a new 18th century Baroque facade. Uh, there you can see the jagged, uh, the jagged um, roof walls of uh, that, of course, medieval building, but it's re redone and broke. Uh, other buildings uh, are definitely Renaissance townspeople's houses, but uh, you, here you can see the black and white Renaissance graffito that was uncovered, uh, but uh, overall they have a uh, Baroque face. Um, that's where a lot, a lot of fun in Prague is like when you go through the streets and you, uh, and you discover like fragments of previous architectural uh, forms that were uncovered on uh, these new buildings. Baroque, however, is the final, um, the final touch up on historical Prague. Many of these streets uh, do just have a Baroque feeling to them, uh, despite being like different in their core, despite like be having the stone or the brick uh, from previous centuries, Baroque is sort of the final, uh, the final makeup on Prague. Um, and um, And so the city, it kind of has a medieval slash Baroque feeling to it. Yeah. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes my presentation. So thank you so much. So folks, let's give Max a big virtual round of applause for a great presentation. Uh, very thorough, Max. Uh, I appreciated all the um, history that you provided. Uh, and folks, we'll take 10 minutes of questions. If you have any questions, you can type them into the q and If you have any comments, you can type them into the chat, and I will start firing away. Uh, and I'm going to mispronounce half these words, Max, as you already know. 
Uh, Christopher asks, how did a significant German presence get so close to Kazakhstan? Um, well, um, when we're talking these like very, very, very far German colonies uh, in Russia, for example, or even in Ukraine, um, we're talking about the 19th century. We're talking about uh, German settlers settling down close to Kazakhstan in a time when then when there would be already railways. Uh, you know, some Russian aristocrat, perhaps even the Czar, would think about you know, like in the 19th century, uh, how do we like uh, how do we boost the economy of this region? How about if we promise some Germans land and they can come and settle down? And uh, like build up a town and build up a factory, build it, build up a brewery, you know, bring some money. Uh, so and then uh, they would like send agents to Germany on train, and then uh, the Germans uh, would come on train. So that's that's how. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for all the questions. I will try to. I I hope it was somehow comprehensible what I was presenting. Uh, and uh, yeah. Yeah, no, you did great. Uh, Christopher asks, uh, what language family is Czech part of? Is it related to German or is it more Slavonic? It is, Czech is a Slavic language. Um, yeah, I, my emphasis in the beginning was like, uh, it's not about ethnicity, it's not about language. Uh, by a large part, it is about, uh, you know, the religion uh, or the politics, but Czech is a Slavic language which means uh, our closest relative is Slovak. We, uh, Czech and Slovak are actually uh, mutually intelligible. That's why we could have a republic of two nations for, uh, for, for uh, 80 years. Uh, there's also a very strong relation to Polish, although the phonetics are different. Uh, and uh, then uh, of course, also um, a big, uh, also further ties to Russian, server Croatian, Ukrainian, um yeah um it, it is a western slavic language there's uh in in especially in colloquial czech there is a lot of german loan words until today um despite the germans being completely gone for um sorry since the late 40s um uh, colloquial czech will still have a lot of germanisms and uh, i would say there's also like similar semantics like uh you know how it is, how uh, uh, the translation of vocabulary does not always translate perfectly, how in, in one language, you know, um, how like Czech, for example, has uh, seven different words for cutting, depending on what material you're cutting, but um, we don't have the word, we have only one word for ship and boat, uh, or arm and arm and hand a leg and foot, there is no distinction there, but uh, a lot of semantics between Czech and German actually be align very well. Uh, let me uh, read you some of the comments and then we'll uh, circle back to a few more questions. Uh, Stephen said, this is the best tour I have ever had anywhere. Most uh, tours uh, show buildings, plazas, food and shops and provide some history but not to the depth and with the intellect that Max has. Uh, Beatrice says this was incredible. Marianne says this was a fantastic morning. Robin says, what a beautiful city. I also learned a great deal about history. Nancy says this was wonderful. I appreciate the history at the beginning and your knowledge of the art. Jean says, what a superb presentation history, travel, art, architecture, and so much more. I thoroughly enjoyed your talk. Uh, Christopher says, you made me want to visit in person, so mission accomplished. I also loved all the historical backgrounds and maps. Uh, Judy says, a lot of interesting information. Thank you. Uh, Barbara says, extraordinary. Dory says, great presentation. Bravo. Thank you very much. Frank also says bravo, and he'd like a part two encore, says fantastic presentation. And let me jump back to the Q&A here. May says wonderful presentation. I loved the Starbucks. You can split this presentation into three more seminars on churches, on history, and on gardens. I can't wait to visit someday. Uh, so next question goes to Joyce. 
is the large German population the reason the Munich Agreement gave parts of Czechoslovakia to Hitler? Yes. I mean, for those of you who don't know, um, um, in uh, like uh, when I uh, when I go back to the modern Czech history, like before I started introducing the monuments, I uh, said that, um, you know, after the Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart, Czechoslovakia was created as sort of a, a solution to um, the oppression of nations, but uh, also um, flipping the problem, uh, the uh, upside down, instead of really solving it, because Czechoslovakia had uh, huge territories with uh, Czech Germans. and. Um, not really, uh, and, and um, it is a big problem of the Czechs. Um, well, it was a big problem of the Czechs that they, instead of uh, being, uh, they were sore of winners, let's put it this way, after World War I. Uh, and they started to oppress uh, the German minority in the same way as they were oppressed uh, as a Czech minority in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And that made these Czech Germans uh, big fans of Adolf Hitler who wanted them to join the Reich. And then Hitler sort of uh, went up to France and Great Britain, uh, telling them like, hey, uh, um, all I want for Christmas is uh, just all the Germans in one simple right. And uh, what can't I? Uh, and, and so what if you what if you what if we had an agreement uh, made in a beautiful city like Munich, that all the Czech German territories will be ceded to Germany. And if we can have that, then um, I won't start war. Um, which was a lie. Of course, he started war half a year, uh, one, one year later, pretty much against Poland. And, uh, yeah, um, but yes, it was the main reason behind why the Munich Agreement was, uh, because there were these Czech Germans. Yes. Uh, Nancy says Max was excellent. I was in Prague about 12 years ago as part of a tour of Central Europe, and I didn't see as much then as I did today. Uh, my late husband was an architect who worked at TAC in Cambridge for the great Walter Gropius. Uh, he always uh, went to Prague, fabulous talk. Uh, we'll take a few more questions. Uh, Virginia asks, can you recommend any lesser known or off the beaten path sites to see in Prague? Well, uh, yeah, also thank you for all the positive feedback. I, uh, I'm so, so overwhelmed after an hour of talking. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you for all the positive comments. It means so much to me. And uh, about the question, uh, yeah, um, off the beaten path. Uh, I've shown some of this off the beaten path also in the presentation. Um, there's, first of all, the, the Loretto, the pilgrimage site, which is absolutely gorgeous um, in, in Castletown, or uh, the St. Agnes Convent, uh, the 13th century monastery uh, that hosts exhibition of Czech medieval art. Um, what else? Um, the and Max, 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 let me yeah. let me follow up with this question. Uh, Kai asks if you were to suggest one place a visitor of Prague must visit, what would it be? Um, one place. Well, the thing is, nowadays Prague is such a popular destination for tourists, so it's. Um, it really depends on what you like, what's your priorities, because uh, if you want to avoid the big crowds, there's plenty of beautiful monuments that are uh, overshadowed by the main stuff. But also, you know, seeing the clock, seeing the bridge, seeing the castle, regardless of the big crowds, is kind of a must, because those big key monuments of the era of Charles IV are just um, incredible. Um, I think the main site of Prague is Prague, if, uh, because it's such a such a complex and organic uh, thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, be sure. I would my recommendation would be uh, do not die on the hill of visiting one particular monument, but go deep and have a holistic approach. Uh, that would be that would be my recommendation. And don't go, don't don't just go for the pretty, go for the meaning, because there's apart from all the pretty, mm -hmm. there's also a lot of meaningful. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, let's, uh, we'll wrap it there because I have to jump on a Zoom, another Zoom at 12. Let's give Max a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. Uh, Max, I'll circle back to you in one second if you have any last words. Uh, but folks, look for an email from me later today with the recording, with a feedback survey, and with information about some other upcoming travel programs that might be of interest, all right? So that'll be sent probably within the next two to three hours. Uh, Max, do you have any last words for the audience? Well, nothing but thank you uh, for, uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in for the questions. Uh, thank, thanks to you, Robert, for organizing this. And uh, thank you to one Jeffrey Dimmerman, uh, who uh, really introduced me uh, at all to the possibility of doing these uh, of doing these online seminars. Yes, That's yes, all. thank you. I'm glad that Jeffrey got me in touch with you. Yes. Uh, so thanks so much, Max. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time. Have a good thank one. You. Yep. Goodbye. Bye -bye.